Hello everyone and welcome back to the Contineros podcast. The podcast is sponsored by Port Pro, the leading operating system for drayage carriers. Schedule a demo today at portpro.io. In the studio today for episode 88 for his third uh, visit, Mr. Matt Schrapp. He's the CEO of the Harbor Trucking Association. And today we're going to go into all these acronyms. You know, we're going to define and do our best. Well, he'll do his best because I'm just as confused as most of you guys. So he'll do his best to make it easy to understand and basically review all of these, all of these things. AB5, AQMD, EPA, CARB, VIS, Truckers, the acronym, TRUCRS, Database Reporting, Clean Truck Check Reporting Database, and all that shit that sounds confusing yeah. AF. So, Matt, please help us. You got it. Well, I know what the AF stands for, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's the, the, the joke is that in government, it's just an alphabet soup of acronyms, right? So we'll start with truckers, right? It's the Truck Regulation Upload Compliance Reporting System. Uh, if the state of California does anything well, it's, it's acronyms. Mm-hmm. Then you have obvious, AQMD is the Air Quality Management District. You have the VIS, which is a vehicle information system. The CTC VIS, actually, which is a clean truck vehicle information system, clean truck check vehicle information system. AB5, that's Assembly Bill 5. Uh, you know, there's plenty. EPA, obviously, Environmental Protection Agency. So all of those acronyms work, you know, w- together essentially to create this construct for us and how we, as trucking companies, as truck owners, how we comply, right? So AB5 is a is a bill that came through the legislature, was signed by the governor, seeing all this... Uh, you know, news lately about, you know, California Trucking Association's lawsuit was just heard on Monday again. So the expectation is there should be a decision in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but that doesn't have any bearing on the air quality stuff. The air quality stuff is the majority of those acronyms, the truckers, the VIS, ARB, CARB, California Air Resources Board. They're the ones who are in charge of all of the regulatory policy for in-use heavy-duty equipment operating in California, including drayage trucks, especially drayage trucks. So the AB5 thing is just going to be for the misclassification part of things. That's right. The, but the, the air is like they still want to say the, exactly. the air and all. The planet. Yeah, yes, the, the planet, yes. yes. That, that's the motivation really a lot these days is climate change, greenhouse gas reductions, carbon reductions. What's challenging for the trucking industry is that really when we look at a, a greenhouse gas or, or carbon footprint, it's basically fuel. So how much fuel are you using? The less fuel you use, the lower your quote-unquote carbon footprint is going to be. And unfortunately, the, the driving force now is this you know, idea that California is going to lead the way. It's the only regulation like it in the world. That's the ACF, another acronym, the Advanced Clean Fleets Rule. Not can be confused with the ACT, which is the Advanced Clean Trucks Rule, which is the mandate on manufacturers to sell a certain percentage of zero emission vehicles as part of their total sales uh, starting here in, uh, well, next year. So uh, if you are a dealer or an OEM, you have to, depending on the GVWR category, have to start selling certain percentages each year until 2036 when you can only sell zero emission class eight trucks in California. So that's the advanced clean trucks rule. And the ACF is the, the complementary end user rule that says, okay, we're gonna we're forcing the manufacturers to build this stuff. Now we're gonna start forcing people to more or less buy it. And so it's a what we call an in use mandate, which means if a truck is active, rolling miles in California, no matter where it's from, is subject to air resources board rules. And this latest in use rule we just got out of the truck and bus rule right I'm sure everybody remembers at the end of last year no 2007 through 9 engines anymore unless it's natural gas or non diesel platform uh, turning over everybody to 2010 minimum model year engine standards uh, that's a rule that's been around the truck and bus rule that had a drage component as a, a whole separate rule but kind of complementary to each other in 2023 
Uh, that rule is basically fully implemented now. It, the drainage portion is sunsetted. We have this one year in 2023 where there aren't any mandates for the year of 2023. Then starting 1124, you cannot add additional capacity into any port in any in the, where in the state or into a class one rail yard service unless it's zero emissions. Okay, that, that's good that you clarified that it's not just the port thing, it's the yeah. statewide thing. Statewide, statewide. So okay. every class one rail yard, every port from San Diego, Stockton, Sacramento, Humboldt, Wainimi, any port, not just LA Long Beach, not just Oakland, it's statewide standard that says, you know, you can register to do business with individual ports, that's one thing, but you have to be in the statewide system. So everybody who's been operating down here or even in Oakland or anywhere, for that matter, identified as a drayage truck in California, they ported that information over from the old database, which is called ARBOR, right? There's another acronym for you. It's an Air Resources Board Electronic Reporting System, where you still report TRU info. Uh, it used to be the drayage reporting center. Now now it's truckers, the, the trucker standard. So you go in there, you report your equipment, you make sure that it's in there. Uh, they say they ported over all the data, but you know how data porting can go, you know, data inputting can go. So you got to make sure that you're in the system. That That's a critical part. In the system. So by in being the in the system, is that what this uh, $30 fee is around? A whole nother rule. A so whole nother system whole nother we're getting system. into there? Yep. So See you, what I mean? I, yeah, it's absolutely. I do not envy anybody who's trying to navigate this stuff. You know, there's some resources out there to help people. We do educational webinars we're doing an in-person seminar on december 7th at the port of long beach save the date guys save the date yep uh you can go and register on our website we're putting out on social media just register through eventbrite uh it's from two to four and then we're there's a supply chain meetup after it in the same place at the harbor maintenance facility so it's free to attend uh, you'll kind of come in here from myself a representative from the port of long beach a representative from socal edison and then someone who's there to really help folks kind of actually register their equipment in the truckers database that's for acf right so you gotta be in the system by the end of the year statewide trucker system not just the pdtr statewide trucker system by the end of the year that's like the in use truck side now the VIS is the vehicle information system, right? Clean truck check vehicle information system, CTC VIS. That is basically the diesel smog check. So you got to pay 30 bucks, has to be in by the end of this year into a different database. So you, there is two different databases that every truck in California, especially for drayage, has to be in by the end of this year. And the Small check is 30 bucks per truck and that's not the test that's just the registration to register the truck into yeah. the smog check system yeah. and then the other 30 is to register it because it weighs more than fourteen thousand. yeah so it has so there's like there's more than one occasion where you'll pay the 30 dollars in addition to the process oh. only one time so you pay the 30 bucks one time okay. for your truck then you pay that every single year okay and there's, you know, I, I have not personally done it, but there's some payment mechanism that you can do for the $30 within the database. Although there's all these acronyms, do they all live under one, do they all fall under one roof as far as yeah. like navigating through, because a lot of guys want to register and they don't know where to start, yeah. you know, because with all the acronyms, you don't know if, where you should uh, go to. Does it all live under a, sp a specific uh, site? Well, the ARB hosts it all. So the Air Resources Board hosts it all on okay. their website, which is arb.ca.gov. And you can try to navigate around within there. We've tried to cut through all that. We put a link on our website at harbortruckers.org to just go. It's right there on the homepage, CARB mm -hmm. Resources, mm -hmm. or you go under Industry Issues, and you'll see CARB Resources. And in there, you'll have a link to the Truckers Reporting System, the Vehicle Information System, as well as a couple, you know, one page documents to try to look at as a fact sheet to see what do I need to register the truck for the vehicle information system that's smog check. Mm -hmm. What do I need to register? What kind of info do I need? That's the 30 bucks. And then the truckers is free, right? You don't have to pay for an individual truck in the statewide system. Down here, LA Long Beach, there's a per vehicle fee that to put into their port drainage truck. Ah, uh, okay, okay. But there's that that's separate. And so the um, kind of the overarching umbrella is really the state of California, the, their resources board. 
So if you don't do drayage, you don't need to register and uh, uh, go through extra registry process. Right. You don't have to do the trucker's reporting if you're not a drayage carrier. Okay. If you're not a drayage carrier, you don't have to do trucker's reporting. Now, depending on a fleet size threshold under the high priority fleets, HPF, here's another acronym, under the ACF rule. I'm writing these down. Yeah, yeah. There's... Um, a requirement if you have 50 or more trucks you make 50 million dollars a year or you collectively dispatch 50 or more vehicles in california uh, then you're required to either follow this phase-in schedule where depending on the gvwr category and body type you need to start putting in zero emission vehicles into your fleet every year more stringent percentages that you need to meet after that but if you're just a drayage carrier, then all you have to do is put it in truckers, identify it as a drayage truck, and then you're subject to useful life. You got to report your mileage. Once the truck turns 12 years old and the engine turns 13 years old, then you start reporting your mileage, which first comes up in 2025. So 1125, if you got a 2011, 10, uh, 12 or 13 truck, 10, 11 or 12 engine. One one twenty five. You have to report your mileage by February thirty first, and then by or excuse me, February fifteenth, February fifteenth of twenty twenty five. If you have eleven, twelve, or thirteen truck, you have to report your mileage. And at that point, if you're over eight hundred thousand miles, they will remove you from the system. And so, if you don't put a truck in, if you know that you're gonna, you know, mileage out in twenty twenty five, because you know you have a twenty ten with a million miles on it. Come 2025, you report that, you're out of the system by March 31st. So if you want to replace your truck before then, you got to do it by the end of this year, which is you know challenging. It's a challenging rate environment. It's a challenging borrowing interest rate environment. So it's, you know, all the chips are really stacked, stacked against the industry right now. But if you do not put in whatever additional capacity you think you might need in 2025, if you're being removed from it, you can't enter in any additional internal combustion engines into the system. That's the trucker system for mm -hmm. doing port service. Mm -hmm. So if you're not doing port service, that is not necessarily a concern unless you're this 50 truck, 50 fleet threshold. Yeah. Um, so I'm not lost if I, I didn't misunderstand that this information you just shared, mm -hmm. like as of like the last couple of minutes, yeah. applies mostly to uh, carriers with like 10 trucks or more, right? Like big, big carriers? It is, so the vehicle information system, the diesel smog check is everybody. Everybody. No, no okay. fleet size restrictions, okay. nothing. Whether you're coming from Canada, right, yeah. Maine, Texas, if you come into California, you will need to demonstrate that you've reported that truck into the clean truck check. Um, in, for the California-based carriers, they will deny your registration if you're not in the clean truck check. So that's for everybody. Mm -hmm. And then drayage... There's no fleet size restrictions. The drayage side, also no fleet size restrictions. But if you're not doing drayage, you don't have to report. Okay. I guess I'm trying to get it down to like uh, how, how would, uh, or does it matter? Does it need to be broken down this way or not? You let me know. How would uh, a, a big fleet mm -hmm. navigate through these things versus uh, an owner operator with one or two trucks per se? What, how would, would there be a difference in strategy or? Well, you know, not at, at its core, not really. It, it's okay. the same thing. You got to report your trucks regardless. How you approach it, obviously, it varies where if you have, a, you know, if you can download a CSV or you create a CSV from your fleet, like comma separated value document in Excel, then you can upload that into the trucker's database is, is how it's supposed to function. Same with the clean truck check. You can download from truckers and upload that information separately. The, the systems don't talk to each other yet. So if I'm a big fleet, like I start thinking about that like right now to make sure I have all of my trucks in truckers in the database. And if, if, I'm, if I got one or two trucks, you know, it's difficult because like, you know, you're doing payroll, your HR manager, right? You're a small business. You have to take the time to go and just put that truck in individually into each system it feels like you're just feeding the system to give them the information they need to enforce things on you and if they want it so bad at least earn it and and find a way to get that information yourself versus us you know uh setting up the news 
Yeah, they, uh, you know, it's a, <laughs> I know what you're saying, right? You'd think that there would be more resources or they would be able to identify those directly, but, you know, they expect people to self-report. It's almost a self-enforcement. And then they utilize that to determine who they're going to go after. <sighs> if you are, you know, if you pull up to a scale and ARB happens to be there and even CHP can ask for it, is this document that says you've reported into the clean truck check. If you pull into a scale and they poke their head in and they flag you over to an ARB inspection, provided the ARB is there, and you have a check engine light on, you know, even if it's covered up with duct tape, if it's on, that'll be a violation on the spot. And then you have, you have to correct it. You typically have 30 to 45 days to correct it. And then they'll clear it. You do another test, right? It's just like how we do with our passenger vehicles. It's the same. You plug into like the OEM or the CAN bus. Mm -hmm download the data that uploads to the ARB that's for the smog check site so they expect us to do uh, the the onus is on you to report what if you're not registered and they find out then and there at the scale when they plug plug in they will cite you there's you no get, lot of service for that maybe uh, or? only if your registration for some cite reason you. got valid invalidated okay because you didn't report and then they went through and did the VIN check and the DMV basically freezes your registration. If a CHP mm -hmm. finds it then, then yes, there's potential out of service from that if you don't have valid registration. Uh, but not from just, I, I didn't report, they're not going to put you out of service at that point in time. Either way, it wouldn't stop there, right? Uh, eventually, they would find out like the details of your registration and whatnot, and 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 stop you that way, maybe. Yeah, or? they wouldn't. So you get a, you know, when your renewal comes up, part of the check, just like how we do with mm -hmm. our passenger cars, same mm -hmm. exact thing. If you don't have that diesel smog check, clean truck check done, they're not going to issue your registration until you do that. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So they are. There's some hope that they will. Uh, at least send out notices then because you mentioned dmb like dmb always sends me mm -hmm. actually a few months in advance a right. reminder like your registration is up yeah you know so do you want those stickers and send in that payment exactly right exactly will something similar happen i would here? imagine that's what they've said more or less is that they'll okay. notify but the onus is on you they're they're not going to you know if they do send out something They've sent out all. They've sent out tens of thousands of like little postcards mm -hmm. that say, "Hey, your truck may be subject to one of these rules X, yeah. Y, Z." Uh, I've talked to plenty of fleets that say they never got that. You know, even though the the DMV database is readily available to the ARB, they have everybody's address, they know your VIN, they know who owns the truck, whether it's an individual, a company, whatever. They they know them all, mm -hmm. and so you know they're gonna do that comparison and see okay this VIN over here is it in it's, there's its registration is it in the truck truck clean truck check VIS if so all good but you have basically 180 days prior to when your registration is due where you can submit your information so similar to diesel smog check so likely when you get your registration there'll more than likely be a notification that you need to register or at least update and this is two times a year that you need to do this. So two times a year, you need to go and get this clean truck check done. You register once, right? But then you got to go find a dealer or a service center or a third party provider that's going to do the test, upload the system to the ARB. And that's again, based upon where, where your registration falls. Okay. That, that touches on a subject that, um, you know, we can't act like it's not a thing, right? Uh, for some time, um, with all new technology, it takes time for people to catch on and see what hacks there are. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Or oh, loopholes. Yeah. So right. a, a lot of these trucks were breaking down because of these emission systems. And right. so I'll just cut to the chase. Yeah. There's a lot of deleted trucks out there. So what what is someone that has a... A deleted a truck with a deleted emission system mm -hmm. what should they do uh should they like get rid of it or, or try to put it back on or what happens if they i guess i have many questions within one what happens if they get tested and now it shows is there a way they'll detect that it's deleted and what happens then like yes uh, well so 10 11 and 12 engines don't have the same ecm can bus oh yeah you know onboard diagnostic mm -hmm. systems that the 2013 and later engines do mm -hmm. so 
depends on the truck year and how they're going to test you. But if if you are caught with a deleted system or you know a gutted PM filter, uh, that's tampering, and they will basically cite you right there for having uh, you know tampered with an emission system, which is its own you know its own offense. The test will detect that that is deleted. Yeah. More than likely. More than likely, like I would say, probably a hundred percent, and you know, especially in the 2013 or later, 2010, 11, and 12 engines have to still do the smoke tests, like we've been, like we've been doing. Mm -hmm. If you have two or more trucks, now it's everybody. If you got one truck, uh, then you need to start doing the smoke test. So, what's the difference there? Smoke test and and the plug-in. One so is the just, smoke test, yeah. it can be deleted, and the smoke is still coming out nice and clean, and won't detect it allegedly, or. What is the scenario there? I mean, you know, it's, why does it sound like you have a higher probability to get away with it? Not that you're endorsing it or approving yeah, right, right, it. I'm just saying this is the situation. There are that years. There's trucks within the, those years that are deleted, and there's also sure. trucks that are deleted uh, 13 and up. Sure. So does this mean once again the the 10, 11, and 12s have a higher probability of? slipping through the cracks and getting away with it for now or i mean based on the maybe but yeah. it's, it's don't risk it right i would yeah that, that's kind of the gist right there there's loopholes there's way around it's a matter of like you know try and catch me catch me if you mm -hmm. can right mm -hmm. and that unfortunately they'll get to you eventually there there's mm -hmm. no way because you know as with uh, especially in drayage you know those trucks need to start reporting their mileage and they could be just mileaged out of the system to begin with out of drayage. And then you go to try to sell it to somebody, you know, you do a peer to peer sale, maybe it can keep perpetuating, but you try to go turn it into a dealer. They won't touch that truck with a 10 foot pole if it's all been deleted here in California. Uh, Cause then they'll have liability unless they're gonna take it and then re, you know, re upload or put a new filter on or, you know, whatever. Is the reporting instantaneous that you know of? Like, for example, like so, yeah. if you go and test and be like, oh, I got a dirty test. Oh, don't, don't, don't submit it. Don't submit it. I'll be back. I'm going to fix my stuff. Right. There's you know no, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know what's interesting is that it's really what it's looking for is fault codes in the engine outside of the smoke testing, which is just pure opacity, mm -hmm. how much light is coming through the smoke. And the, the thresholds are high enough where, you know, um, but... If you're uh, doing the upload, then more or less it's just just like with our passenger cars. So they communicate that information immediately. If you do the test and it says, "Hey, you got a bunch of fault codes here," I would imagine that the service provider is going to tell you that before they upload it, right? Um, and that's the the plus with the 10, 11, 12s, or all of them. That'll be the the 13 and later engines will have that, you know, because the, they have the Ombre diagnostics. That probability, okay. So you'll know. The 11, 12, 10, 11, 12 engines, you aren't doing that plug-in test, right? So, yeah, you're not. But if, if, if the testing facility is like, holy smokes, this is dirty, bro. What's yeah. going on? At that point, has it been submitted? That, that was my question. I don't I you think don't, that they have to like hit send. So there's still hope that they would be like, hey, you need to fix I your would, thing. Wherever you go, and <laughs> I can't say that they're going to not charge you for the second test. Right? Yeah. But you go the first time you have the conversation with them up front. Like, hey, if you find active fault codes, don't report that. Let me, you know, fix it, basically, whatever I need to do. So, or they'll come back to you, especially if it's like a service center at an OEM dealer. They're going to tell you like... You know, you, you have these active fault yeah, codes. Yeah. Here's what we need to do to fix it. Then we'll retest and then submit. So, I mean, I would have that conversation with that service provider at right. any time. Yeah. But in all likelihood, I mean, I, don't, I just doubt that they're going to yeah. report it. Because nine times out of ten, those, those service, uh, those testing facilities are going to be third parties, right? It's not... Uh, CARB itself, right? No, not CARB They're itself. like contracted with them? or The what? closest thing that ARB has to it is that they have portable emissions monitoring systems. Is there an acronym for that? PEMS, <laughs> P-E-M-S, or a PEAQS, P-E-A-Q-S. It's like portable emissions, air quality, something. I, you know, I forget that acronym. Oh, man. I forgot that one. Running out of ink here. P-E-A-Q-S, right, you know, peaking. So there's there's that they're like sniffers right <laughs> so if you're driving and it sniffs that you're mm. emitting uh -huh, then it does an ocr takes a photo of your license plate front license plate right and then you get a letter in the mail that says you know you need a notice to submit testing nst notice to submit test 
you get an NST in the mail, then you got to submit that proactively, separate from the fact that you have your intervals for testing in the first place. All right, guys, I hope I'm not confusing you guys. I feel like a little bit of pressure, like if I get the opportunity to ask these questions, like I want them to be solid and at least yeah. understandable, right? When, when, yeah, the, the um, way to know is to ask questions always honestly, man. I, uh, know, like, there's, the, there's no such thing as a bad question, right? It's like, yeah, this it's stuff just, is just, fucking confusing. Um, okay. How about this? You, you know, with the bus rule, what do you call it? The truck and bus truck and bus rule. Yeah. I came in, right? right. There, there was this time period where like, I saw it, it, it kind of separated the drivers because the ones that got the newer trucks weren't willing to park the trucks with the ones that had the older trucks. Okay. You know what? There was that, that brief period where they were combined, the, the years, right? So like, do you get me? Like, me... some trucks were being phased out eventually, right? They were getting within that proximity of, of mm-hmm. going out. Yeah. And the guys that had a newer truck, like 12 and up, yeah. Yeah. I would say, they weren't willing to stop with them, right? Because it's like, hey, I already upgraded. It's not my problem. Right. Right. So is there a gap in the time frames right now? Well, you know, because everybody got, to, everyone was supposed to get turned over as of one one twenty three. right? Yeah. So you you have to have a minimum 2010 engine. So if you're a 2012 guy and you already spent the money and, you know, it comes that 2022 date and you're already in the system, so you're grandfathered in, L.A. Long Beach, for instance, is if you want to enter a truck into their system, it has to be 2014 truck or later. Yeah. But the statewide is 2010 engine and later. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So that's what I'm saying. Right now, they're all under one bracket, finally. Yeah. Right yes. now, it's all one thing, 2010 and up. Yep. Right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank God, because now I could ask this question. So, because I was hoping there's a strategy like, um, like a blueprint, like a one-size-fits-all yeah. type of... Uh, action right take course of action so you're within that bracket Mm -hmm. you have let's just do a a, keep it simple we have one truck your owner operator you have one truck it's a 2010 yeah um what do you do what's your first what's your first move check your mileage first kind of get an idea about your opera annual operating mileage accumulation and start doing some math because come 2025 (laughs) <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry to interrupt. You have to say this. There is still a bracket difference. You know what it is now? Now exactly. it's not the year. Now it's the miles. Right. So the year dictates when you need to start reporting. Oh, so the, as soon as your truck turns 12 years old, that's when your reporting deadline is. So <laughs> you're, you're too far from the mic. So, so come, come one one twenty four. You have to be in the system. Whatever your engine model year is, <coughs> excuse me. Regardless, mm-hmm. as soon as that truck turns twelve years old, you need to start reporting. So, as soon as the truck turns twelve, you need to start reporting. So, 2025, 2011, 12 and trucks are now twelve years and older, <coughs> and they need to start reporting. If at that time you're over eight hundred thousand miles, you're out. You, you need a water break. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. We gotta have mercy on on this guy uh, defining all the acronyms <laughs> so day in and day so out. Talking. <laughs> you know, he just got back from Oakland, life. actually, right? I did. I was in Oakland Monday, Tuesday, and then uh, I was in Sacramento yesterday actually, <laughs> for the Air Resources Board hearing on their funding plan. Uh, you know, we try to be engaged in everything we can. We're, we have a great partnership with CTA. Putting in work. Yeah, we work very closely with them on legislation and statewide policy. They're, they've actually filed a lawsuit. <clears throat> excuse me, on ACF, so, which we can talk about later. But for all intents and purposes, like as of today, once that truck turns 12, you got to start reporting. So the gap is within mileage. So your age kind of determines when do I need to start reporting. But if you're at 800,000 or more and your reporting date is coming up, you're going to be removed from the system if you're over 800,000 miles. And, you know, my odometer doesn't work or whatever and it's all the honor system more or less but they can audit you and say i want to see your 90-day inspection reports that shows mileage or i want to if you have an ecm they're able to get into the ecm and download mileage information as well what triggers an audit 
either you get one of those uh, notice to submit things, right? Or then they want to come and know more about you because you got to submit. They might that might open up the Pandora's box about other stuff. What do you mean the submit? What is that? That's if you get you know the roadside sniffer, the the PEMS oh, thing. Okay, if okay. you get sniffed out and they take a photo of your license plate, send you a notice to submit. Now you're kind of on their list, right? Otherwise, I mean, they encourage people to call one eight six 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 diesel, and that's basically like the diesel hotline where you can rat people out that you know who are not complying with one of the Air Resources Board rules. Isn't New York doing something similar? So, New York just started in their port just banned as of July first a twenty nineteen ninety eight and earlier engines just as of July first. No, so, but I mean the rats. Oh, I'm sure, I imagine. Because there's people that get that. I saw, well, I actually posted a video, like, I think last year. Mm. Sorry, guys, I'm all over the place. But one thing leads to another, right? Right, right. Um, absolutely. Yeah, there's people getting paid out there to snitch mm. on, on people that are idling. I wouldn't And it goes it based past. on the length. You know, you, you idled, you know, yeah, yeah. X amount of you minutes. Can, you I get can do this that much in California. Commission, you, you can know? do that in California right now, too, with excessive idling. But, Although, you know, those clean idle stickers, right? Yeah. That is basically a, it was from 2007 and later is when that started, that you're a California clean idle. Mm -hmm. And so you can idle longer because the engine was built towards a certain standard that at idle, it's supposed to emit less. Oh, okay, emissions. so that sticker kind of protects you from this. Yeah, I mean, you can't idle outside of a school or a senior mm -hmm. center, right, mm -hmm. or some other protected area. But in general, yeah, you can you can idle that model. As long as you have that sticker, yeah, then, then you're okay. So the, the 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 snitches are the the sniffers in the form of a citizen, right? You can so be the, the, Joe Q Public. So Absolutely. the sniffers and the and the snitches they're yeah. all feeding that database of yeah. trucks to get audited, in addition to the the snitches yep. getting a, a that, fine or that would for be the, the driver. You know, and I don't know if they're doing you know paid to play. I don't think there's like a bounty necessarily, right, for you turning in somebody. Um, and there's no guarantee ARB is going to do anything about it to begin with. I mean, they're kind of have their own enforcement challenges on occasion, but that's what they say. It's like, look, you know, there's a pathway for you. If you observe someone idling more than five minutes or you have someone just belt, you know, rolling coal or whatever in a heavy duty truck, some concerned citizen is can pick up the phone and call or like your competitor also. Like this guy down the street's not doing anything. You know, here's his address. Here's, you know, the trucks. Here's a picture. It's not unheard of. I mean, ethically speaking, that's sort of an individual choice, right? But, you know, ARB has no problem. You know, we call it the stool pigeon provision, right? That you're, you know, you're calling and you're turning people in. So that's how they get that stuff initially. If it's a large fleet, especially, and somebody calls up and says, hey, that X, Y, and Z, then potentially, yeah, you could, sh the ARB could send you a letter and say, we want to see all your dispatch records or, or whatever, um, for every truck that you own. And now we're in a different, because of this clean truck check thing, now you got to show that. You might have to show previous smoke testing records. You're only supposed to keep them for two years. But, you know, here for the uh, advanced clean fleets rule, you're supposed to keep any dispatch records for five years of any truck that you've dispatched throughout the year. If it's your own truck, you know, you're and you're getting dispatched, then technically the dispatch is keeping that data, whoever is dispatching you, the broker, whomever, they have to hold on to that data for five years. What if you're no longer in possession of the vehicle um, for, you know, does it still apply? I would, they'd be harder pressed. Yeah. Meaning like if they're like, oh, I got away with it this long, I don't have it no more. So how are you going to enforce on something that is no longer in my possession? Well, I, I, I have not experienced that yet, but yeah. I mean, I guess that that's kind of one of those enforcement discretion things that it depends on the severity of the violation in ARB's mind. Um, when it was the truck and bus rule, because there was a phase, you know, you could phase in essentially, depending on your fleet size, you could do like a percentage phase in for the truck and bus rule. Mm. Drage has never had any phase ins or fleet sizes. It's always just been either you're in or you're out. And if you're not in, you're out. And so now if you're not in by the end of the year, you're out. And that means after that, the way the ACF works now is that you can't put in additional capacity. So unless it's zero emissions. So that's the kind of the operational, I'm, I need to do business at the port. The other thing is like, I just need to make sure my truck's legal and registered and tested and mm -hmm. all that jazz. 
So when they audit you, it, it depends. If you maybe you have a reefer trailer, now all of a sudden they're like, well, give us information about that reefer. Maybe you got forklifts. They're like, we need to know about those forklifts. Maybe you got a, you know, a top pick in your yard for stacking containers. We need to see the information on that. Uh, so it, it, it depends, right? If you're just a single truck guy and you, you, know, you got rid of the truck, you exited, the likelihood of them coming around to you, I think, is, is less so. Even if someone you know, calls up and they finally get around to going and auditing you because they can find you, but their real mechanism is putting a registration hold on. So if you're like, well, I'm never registering that truck again, now, if there's a registration hold, it goes with the owner. It might have something on the VIN, but you know, DMV and ARB is going to look at the VIN, and it's it's about the company who owned the truck. Not this, you know, the truck itself is can be out of compliance, I guess, in some fashion. But them coming back after the fact for you, if you've already gotten rid of your truck, I, I don't think that's like a, a big. It, I, I wouldn't be worried about that. There's a lot of scenarios that are There's come a in. lot of scenarios, man. I mean, here's yeah. another scenario. All right. You got a, a brand new uh, truck and it's brand diesel and yeah. you're going to get it in there before the deadline. Yeah. Unfortunately, six months into 2024, you total that truck. Yeah. Will you still be able to uh, get another diesel truck in because you yeah. had registered a diesel truck before you, the yes, deadline? Yes, you can. Okay. So the catch with that is, and that's something that we had, you know, told the ARB that they need to recognize it because it's not just an accident. Anything, if your truck is totaled out for any reason, um, you can go to them, say, look, here's my my insurance forms, here's a police report, whatever it is to show that truck is gone. You can then get another internal combustion truck, but it's going to be subject to the same useful life that the previous truck was. Oh, so you pick it, up on the miles you, you were at. You pick up on the mileage, and then the truck year is going to be when you're supposed to report. So if it's a brand new truck with a 2023 engine, I mean, that has the full, it's, it's not full useful life, but it has right now under ACF, you have until 2035. So it, the new truck, even if it's a newer model, it's still going to be, so, the details of the previous truck will kind of get grandfathered in. Yeah. So if the truck is newer than the one you had, it's still going to go. doesn't matter, right. It's going to okay. go to the older one, exactly. <laughs> And there's no, you can't sell other trucks to other people in the DTR. One of the concepts that we're trying to look at, if there's an opportunity for a leaf, because, you know, one way or another, this, we are moving towards a zero emission transportation system. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable, right? It, how we get there is going to be the, the challenge. But one of the things we say, well, at a minimum, you should be able to, if I have a truck, I should be able to sell it to somebody else who's also in drayage. As long as that truck is registered and it's going to another truck that's, you know, another operator that's going to be either already in the system or in, in work entering into the system, that would effectively cap the number of vehicles, internal combustion. But, you know, maybe you got some trucks, business is down. I want to sell this thing. You can sell it in California. You just can't sell it to another operator in port service because as soon as that registration changes hands, it's a new event. And now you're going to be precluded from registering that truck with truckers because it's after 1124. Because the new owner is now registering it. Or new owners registering. And they obviously exactly. didn't meet the deadline. They didn't meet the deadline. So, so it doesn't transfer over like that. It doesn't transfer over. So that would be one, one of the concepts that we would say, look, if there's going to be some negotiation oh. that goes down, that's one thing that possibly might help some folks. So that's good news for, uh, well, it's not good news Uh potential resellers that might be like oh this is an opportunity uh i'm gonna buy 10 diesel trucks right uh register them and then next year it's no good because the new buyers won't be able to right that's the way the rule works now that you can't do it so it wouldn't you wouldn't have a benefit if you were buying a bunch of trucks and then your plan was to sell them all to other tr drayage operators because that provision doesn't exist but that would be something if we're going to, you know, if there's, if the ARB is going to try to modify the rule in one way, shape or form, and, you know, we'll be at the table when that's happening, that would be potentially a, a something that could be suggested. But, you know, I mean, because the, the, the knee jerk reaction to most of this stuff is like, oh, it just needs to go away, right? Just go, just make it go away somehow. And that's just not going to happen. That's not a realistic strategy in this. There has to be some give and take. It's basically if nobody's happy at the end result, ARB, the environmentalists, the trucking industry, if nobody feels that it's 
the best thing. If, you know, there's a little pain all around. If it's shared pain, it's probably a better. It's probably a good policy, right? But right now, it's just the environmentalists are in community groups. Man, you know, you guys all know out there. Nobody likes trucks until you need one, and you know, it's like a cop, right? Uh, even though it's the backbone of our our economy, and it's probably put a lot of these young, activated community. Um, activists and environmentalists, probably their parents probably worked for a transportation or a trucking company at some point in time. Uh, it's just the nature of the nature of the beast, right? I mean, one in five jobs in Long Beach is directly related to the port. So it's hard to not have that touch you somehow. And this is, you know, they're just, they're hell bent, man. They, they don't, they don't like trucks. They don't like diesel. It's killing people. We're killing the planet. You know, there's multitude of reasons why they're really pushing this. And the state is has capitulated so far so but we'll see i just i want to say this that just because it's out of sight doesn't mean that it's any better for example uh uh it's it's um the mining for the right. for the minerals for the yeah. the elements needed to make the batteries that whole it's very rarely talked about. I mean, yesterday there's was the kids first doing time. it, and there's like yeah, people yeah, getting yeah. killed. There's people getting like yeah, relocated, right. not relocated, but like get the fuck out. This is right, right. this is our turf yeah. now. No, absolutely. Um, there's a so, there's a couple books out there. One is just came out this year. It's called Congo Red. Okay. Or excuse me, Cobalt Red. My apologies. It's about cobalt mining in the Congo, and you know, yeah, it's child labor. I mean, that's that's the thing, and that so it's extraction. It's refinement. It it's, has all to do with the transportation of the minerals. Uh, you know, China, I believe, controls 80% of all the world's cobalt refining. Um, so you have that potential national security issue as we move, you know, continually towards this need for rechargeable batteries. I know that they're starting to synthesize, like, space metals, right? Uh, I just, do they think about that? Like, when they plug in their iPhone to get it charged and stuff like people that? People don't think about that. I don't. I think that it's, I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm just, no, you know what I mean. I'm, I'm just I'm trying to say, like, can can they meet us halfway? Do you feel that they meet us halfway, or do, or, or is it like really no, extreme, no. like all or nothing? Or, like, Frank, can, the first time I've really heard environmentalists now starting to bring this up was yesterday at this ARB hearing, where a couple were saying, "Hey, you need to look at supply chain emissions and start encouraging manufacturers to be sourcing from cleaner, you know, more sustainable sources for rare earth minerals, etc." So. That's one component, right? It's it's I've I've equated, we're in a game of trade offs, right? Like what what is worth it to people to move us to this zero emission system? Like how how much trucking business, you know, folding up shop, going bankruptcy, getting absorbed, going out of business? How much can we really, you know, kind of stomach when it comes to that to go zero emissions? How many other localized emissions issues like? where they're mining uh, nickel or refining nickel in Indonesia, right? It's like polluting groundwater. Uh, it says, you know, making residents sick, right? So we're trading localized exposure here in California to reduce that and making it worse in other parts of the world. It just, it's, it's hypocritical. So will we get there at some point in time? I'm sure human ingenuity is what it is. It's just like, it takes time. But it's not really brought up. You know, you can talk about the Congolese mm. cobalt and people are like, yeah, that's a real bummer. You know, it's like, well, how's your you know, iPhone, your Tesla, whatever. Probably a lot of ego, you know, because the, these corporations or these uh, agencies or whatever you want to call yeah, it, yeah. you got a better word for them? Uh, these, uh, yeah, yeah, agencies. These entities. I, mean, I can think of some other They're built up of people, but, right? It's, right? It's more than just the logo. It's not yeah. just the acronym. There's people behind that. There's For sure. Right? And... They have egos, so yeah. they have careers. They've made a living off of this, mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of hard to like admit, you know, man, perhaps we're a little bit wrong, you know, because that's Ooh, all yeah, they. Right. It, it would mean like a slap in the face to everything they 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 stand for, like what they represent. Like, yep. Like, what are we here for then, right? And that's a tough uh, statement to make, or it is to and, admit, right? And honestly, that's why their mantra is really: if you don't like it, sue us. Because then they can hide behind the fact that industry is suing them and challenging them on it. And they'll be like, see, it's industry, bad industry. Again, doesn't care about your lungs or your child's asthma or whatever. It's now we can blame it on them, sort of hide behind the fact that industry challenged us. They're the bad guys. The state is just an innocent victim that's trying to protect public health. 
you know, at, at any cost is basically how we've felt. I've been doing this almost 20 years in this regulatory policy realm dealing with the Air Resources Board, and I've never felt like they have been receptive to actual, like, sound regulatory policy up front. It's that, you know, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. I think that they just throw what they can against the wall and then just expect people, like, if you don't like it, then challenge us on it. I just, I get a little upset because, um, like, anger, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, um, yeah. what do you feel? Like, helpless, you know? Yeah, yeah. It feels like, almost like if, um, I can't, it feels like they, I feel, pers- my opinion, I feel like they think the truckers are stupid and, like, we're not going to do shit. And it's like, we're yeah. going to, we're going to bully them in the form of what seems legal by, by, you know, in the form of a bill, in the form of ways that it's out of reach for them to defend themselves with because all they know how to do is react. And they're so busy making a living, working day and night that they don't have time to look into this. Absolutely. And by the time we get our, you know, we get our way, they're fucked. Yep. And they're just reacting. And there's like, oh, where were you? Very, very reactive. Absolutely. And it's very frustrating. But it also, I also feel very thankful that there's a lot of associations and, and, and people yeah. that come together like, like, HTA, CTA, yeah. all these. Uh, We're trying, man. Because if it wasn't you know, for that, how how worse would it be, right? <laughs> It'd be bad. So absolutely, and the it, the challenge with the trucking industry historically, especially since deregulation, is it's kind of a divide and conquer, right? It's a very competitive industry, especially you know in drayage, it's it's competitive, right? We're talking a global marketplace and multinational shipping conglomerates that are making decisions that basically impact the day to day lives of men and women moving containers in the ports, uh, longshore and, you know, our trucker brothers and sisters out there. And my mission has really been to try to get everybody as together as we possibly can, because the only thing that we can arm ourselves with is information. Because if you know ahead of time, and if you know, and look at, I get it. I've heard that, Oh, we just stopped the trucks and you know, we'll see what they do. I mean, I loved the AB5 protests that happened. I thought that that was, you know, it was showing some solidarity amongst the industry about, uh, you know, why this is a challenge. But um, they still left in the end. It was temporary. It was temporary. That's the thing. And so, you know, and we're in a position where, you, you know, as a, as a nonprofit association, we can't like uh, coordinate something like that because it's like a, a violation of antitrust laws in the U.S. because you're like colluding together, right? So, this creates a challenge which you know and that's why they say well that's why everyone needs to be a teamster or a member of a labor union and my response to that is is well there's there's teamster jobs out there right now we have teamster member companies there's nothing wrong with being a teamster nothing but this is america you should have a personal choice if you want to be an entrepreneur and run your business then you should have that god-given right to do so in this country uh, that's what ARB and has, you know, ARB in the state of California is saying, well, yeah, but you, these are the lanes that you have to be in. And AB5 makes it very difficult. There's a lot of ambiguity in AB5. The air quality stuff is a little less ambiguous, ambiguous, but you still need to know about it. You still have to have that information because if you're making investment decisions, all of a sudden you bought a truck and now 2025, you're out of it, Right. They just, they pulled you out. If you didn't know going in that, you know, I got this great smoking hot deal on a 20, well, at this point in time for LA Long Beach, at least it have to be a 2014 truck if you're putting it in right now if for LA Long Beach service. But then you have a 2013 engine. So anything putting in right now, 2014 and up? For LA Long Beach. So the statewide is 2010 and later, right? But if you want to go after the fact, after you register with statewide, and you want to do work in LA Long Beach, the first time you put that VIN into the local PDTR has to be 2014 or later truck. So at that point in time, that means in 2026, you have to start reporting, right? Because you're, now your truck's 12 years old. Mm-hmm. And so you go, you get a great investment, you put it in there, you're gonna have basically, you know, all of 24 and all of 25, and then come one one twenty five, like you're out if you're over 800,000 miles. So. You know, those are the things. And that useful life provision, I've heard it, you know, from guys saying, oh, man, 800,000 miles, like, that's not enough. We need more miles than that. My response is, like, that is the best that we're going to get. That was a bill that CTA sponsored 
um, that basically is part of SB1, the budget in 2017, which resulted in higher diesel fuel tax, right? There's trade-offs again, but it also said, we're gonna provide a useful life for that truck that you get a minimum of 13 years of that engine's use, a minimum. And then after that, you get 800,000 miles or up to eight, you know, or up to 18 years. So that is baked into the health and safety code. The ARB cannot rescind that. That was passed by the legislature. That has its own force and effect. You're going to have to fine tune that part. Yeah. Because I, what I tell guys is, and I've probably been fucking up. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's going to be um, the 13 years mm -hmm. or 800,000 miles mm -hmm. or whichever comes first. Yep. On that on the front end, so the front end is the 13 years. The back end is 18 years. So they're like, what do you mean ends. by front end? Like, that's when your first reporting requirement starts. So you can have a truck that's a million miles, rebuild it, right? Get another 600,000 miles out of it, whatever, and not be reporting. Like, you're okay. You can still operate because your reporting deadline hasn't hit yet. So if I'm operating a 2016 truck, my first reporting, because 16 truck has a 15 engine in it typically, right? My first reporting then is 2028. So I can run 2 million miles come 2028, then I need to report at that point in time. If you're over 800, you're out. Mm. If you're under 800, then oh, you keep okay. going. Oh, okay, that you extra you time. Report, exactly, you report the next year, and then you report the next year after that, and after that, until you get to 18 years. And once the engine is 18 years old, then it's then it's out, no matter what the mileage is. Is there any way to get that down, like in a, yeah, like we, an infographic? We have a one-page uh, matrix on our on our website, like literally harbortruckers.org or .com. Can you any way you could do that, like in a link to where like yeah, it leads yeah. straight to that? Yeah, and we, then, we have it. We absolutely have it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'll shoot. I'll shoot that. I think that'll be better than running numbers. through each scenario, yeah. right? It's right there. It's just a spreadsheet. It's like, here's your model year of your truck, model year of your engine, first reporting date, 800,000 miles, last reporting <clears> date, <throat> you know, kind of retirement. So it's, it's, I put it together specifically because it was, con it's confusing, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I've had this conversation yeah. probably 800 times and it's, you know, I, I get it, right? But if I'm first hearing it for the very first time, it's, it's like, wait, what? Like, I, I right. report, when do I report, right? Do I need to start reporting my mileage right away? It's like, well, you need to start reporting right away, but you don't need to start reporting your mileage. They want to hear all your about all your truck info and who owns it, all that jazz, your CA number. Mm -hmm. Then when it turns 12, when the engine's 13, then you start reporting. All right, so forgive me. Now I'm going to have you do that 801 times, the 801 times. You got it, you got it, absolutely. Before I really interrupted you, because there's things that, get my attention and then I kind of steer the conversation sure, sure. So, um, back to the whole scenario of you have a 2010 truck yeah what are you gonna do first thing you're gonna do is make sure that it needs to be registered into the truckers database if you want to keep doing port work if you're doing drage or or rail work first thing you have to make sure that it's either already in the system or is there and then if it or it's not there then report it right Technically, if you've been doing port work, you were already in the statewide database, whether you knew it or not, that's been ported over. So you got to go to truckers, you got to try to set up an account, just like any other online account. Uh, you get it, you put your VIN in, they're like, hey, this VIN has already been reported. Uh, because maybe you had someone do it for you, maybe your overlying motor carrier helped you do it. Uh, it has a different email, then you got to go through a whole process with having them update the account to your information. So that's the first thing, you got to get that squared away whatever year it is. So I'm a 2010 guy. I'm assuming I've been working down here. So I'm grandfathered into the PDTR. That's the local drainage truck registry, LA Long Beach down here. Did I make it complicated by choosing the 2010 versus a 2014, which is what well, more than likely everyone's going to want to have to. Yeah. I mean, just from the standpoint that 2010 is uh, grandfathered in. That's is the good. only difference. That's the only difference, right? right that okay. it's going in because if you, so if I do have 2014, so I just got this 2014 truck. Make if you just got it, then it's definitely not in the system. Just bap, 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 put that thing in there, and then then go either to your broker or overlying or whatever your business arrangement is. Go to um, them to make sure that they know that they need to now who's ever got the registration agreement and the concession with LA Long Beach, right? 
that they go in and put that truck into the PDTR. That can happen after 1124. The main thing is is getting in the statewide system. That's like the biggest hurdle. So you, what acronym is that system? That's truckers. 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 Get it in there. Get it in truckers. Okay. And that's so that then, deadline, 1231. 1231. That's sure. if you're like, I want to keep doing drayage. Right? Okay. It's going to turn around. I'm feeling good. I'm making money someday, whatever. You have to be in truckers. Now, if you're like, you know what? I'm going to move LTL. I'm going to go over the road. I'm going to do aggregate, whatever. You don't have to necessarily get in truckers, but you have to be in the clean truck check database. That's the CTC VIS, clean truck check vehicle information system. Also linked right on our website, straight to the reporting system. So you have to all, you have to report your truck in there and pay your thirty dollar fee. That's the smog check. If you want to do drayage and still be in California, you got to do both. If you're not doing drayage, you only got to do this one for now. So if you're a drayage guy, 2014, I just got this truck, awesome. Pay your thirty bucks, get it in the system here, get it in the trucker system here. Then now you're statewide. As soon as you're ready to start moving containers, then you know make sure you're in the PDTR, and that's okay after one one twenty four, as long as it's in the statewide database by the end of this year before twenty twenty four starts. So now it's twenty twenty four. I registered the twenty ten. Yeah. In the truckers, what, what next? Let's say I have uh, how many miles you want to say that I have. Well, let's say you have six hundred thousand miles, okay. right? Maybe even higher, like seven hundred thousand. Okay. Come one one twenty four. It's in there. It's in the system. They haven't asked you for your mileage yet, though, because you're not 12 years old. Come 2025, now you need to start reporting. So I'm looking at my truck. I'm thinking about how many miles I'm doing annually. That's another, you got to figure that out because that's going to kind of project. And granted, it, it, it fluctuates, I imagine, for some guys. But then you start doing some math. It's like, all right, if I'm running 50,000 miles a year, I'm at 700 right now. So I go through all of 2024. Now I'm at 750. Now I got to start reporting. And I give my 750 mileage number. They're like, all right, good job. See you next year. Now, if you're running another 50,000 miles through 2024, or excuse me, through 2025, through the next year, your next reporting deadline, and you're at 801,000 miles, you report that information to them. And again, it's auditable, right? So it's, it, it's always open to whatever ARB thinks. You can try to be cute, right? And put like seven ninety nine and mm. report it to them. You know, if they audit you or you get caught up. Plus the other thing is is that because especially on the trucks that have the OE uh, the CAM bus um, ODB onboard diagnostics, mm -hmm. you register to them, technically that data from that engine should have the mileage on it. And so if they compared the two VINs and they start doing their own math, and all of a sudden they're like, you know, this guy should probably be over 800,000 miles based upon his previous use. Let's check that back into the, the clean truck check, right? Make sure that this, these are lining up. They haven't said that's what they're going to do as comparison, but just put it this way, they expect you to be like honest. And so if you're at 799, you put 799. And if you're at 801, Technically, now, by March 31st, that'll be out of the system. If you're still under, if you're at 799, right, legit, take a picture of it because they'll likely ask for something like that, like a photo of the odometer or something that, like a third party that why I did my maintenance. You got to report by February 15th. So from January 1st to February 15th, you want to give them that mileage reading. And if it's over 800,000, you're out. If it's under you know, see you next year. Then the next year you're reporting. And in. you're out for good with diesel or now? Out or for good. Yeah. Now in it's, port service. Okay. Now you can go and take that truck. It's still good in California. Right? Ah, okay. Provided you're in that clean truck check mm. database. So in California, it's still good beyond the 800,000? Uh, yes, for now. I ah, mean, there's okay. the fleet size thing comes into it because of the high priority fleets. But if you're not in the high priority fleets, you're not touched by it at all then yeah, you can continue to run that truck. But they are already promulgating another rule oh. for fleets with 50 or fewer. Because that sounded threshold. like kind of promising at least. Okay, maybe let me squeeze a little more life out of this truck. Right, yeah. Save up for a down payment on, and you come can, back. Right you know? now, you can still operate it outside of port work in California. Or, okay. you know, dra drayage work. We're going to call it dredge because the class one rail yards are included.
for now because you know they they they, they don't stop <laughs> it's always they want more it's never enough oh yeah the diesel particulate matter from the port civilian long beaches emissions uh inventory that they just released was reduced by 98 percent from the trucking industry since 2006 diesel particulate matter was the one that was listed as a toxic air contaminant that is responsible for premature death restricted work days childhood asthma all sorts of stuff right 1988 it was listed as a toxic air contaminant since 2006, we've reduced it here in this port complex by 98%. And that's not enough. It will never be enough. I mean, ever. Until we're all in zero emissions, until the entire grid is all renewable fuel. Because we got to remember that our grid is still powered by, you know, close to 40% natural gas. Because when the sun ain't shining and the wind's not blowing, that's gonna, energy has to come from somewhere. And our main source to supplement the renewables is is not non-renewable fossilized natural gas so while it's a more efficient burn and you don't need as much natural gas as you would say in like a transportation platform in their mind you know they expect the the grid to be fully renewable i think by 2035 is the date i believe or 2040 cool. so you know we'll get to full zero emissions from soup to nuts at some point in time but you know, until then, our lives are going to be an absolute living nightmare trying to figure out this. Plus, all these economic forecasts that I hear are saying Q4 of 24, Q1 of 25 is when we'll start seeing more significant growth. Um, and that's right in time in 2025 when the ARB estimates about 2,000 trucks are going to mileage out of the system come 1125. Those 10, 11, 12 engines, 11, 12, 13 trucks, when they report, the estimate is 2,000 are going to be gone by March 31st. So for some may see an opportunity to be like, well, if we're going to see 2,000 trucks removed from the system when we're on our way up for higher cargo volumes, I'm going to put some trucks in now, sit on them. You have to visit a port one time a year to keep them active. Any facility, not just LA Long Beach, any covered facility. Um, you're Then, you know, come 25 when there's a capacity crunch potentially, then you have some assets that you can deploy because you put them into the system early. What years would those be? Any year, right? 2014 model your truck minimum for LA Long Beach service, but otherwise it's a 2010 engine. Okay. So if you're not doing, if you're just doing Oakland, technically you put that 2010 engine into the statewide system and then you can go into Oakland, you're good. As long as you do your reporting and your mileage, the upkeep and everything. Uh, so... There, there's that potential, but here, you know, so you can go get, I guess, if you want to go buy a bunch of 2011 trucks and park them against the fence and, you know, wait, wait it out and see what happens, but they have to be active because they have to go into a facility one time a year to maintain eligibility. Okay. Okay. That's a lot to take in, but I feel I get it a little bit better than the last yeah, two times. Yeah. So it's, it takes a lot of, you know? Yeah, man. I, and, I, um, I feel for everybody out there. <laughs> Trust me. I value your time. I know you had mentioned there's some uh, time constraints to a degree, yeah, right? So yeah. we're hitting that mark. So how, in, in closing, I would say, oh, yeah. sort of, um, where are we in that timeline? We, we ran through the timeline then pretty yeah. much, right? Yeah. That truck got phased out. It got to eight hundred thousand, seven hundred ninety nine point nine, right, seven hundred ninety nine. Right, 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 exactly. And so that's a basic scenario. That's, that's right. A, yep, that is kind of the cut and dry. Report by the end of this year. Track your mileage. Once the truck turns twelve, now you start reporting your mileage. But you got to be in the system by the end of the year. That's what. No extensions, because some guys are asking. You think there'll be extensions? They're not doing nothing about it. So, just... the CTA has sued the state of California on the advanced clean fleets rule. I think it was October 26th that the the lawsuit was filed. The complaint was filed. Um, whether or not there's an injunction put on that 1124 date remains to be seen. You have to prove harm in order to get some type of injunction. And that depends on the judge you get to determine whether or not this is like a harmful regulation that starts in 1124. Depends on the judge. It could be like the AB5 scenario all over again, right? We kind of thought it was going to go away or whatever, and it did Right, and then it got enjoined for two yeah. years, and then all of a sudden, June 30th of 2022, it's like, it's back. So don't let that happen again, just in case. Yeah, it's you got to plan for the fact that it's going to probably uphold. Okay. But there is that possibility. But that's only because the industry has stepped up and already given, you know, a, close to a million dollars in funding towards this lawsuit. You know, I mean, this Yeah, is, over 22... Uh, Associations, organizations, different, different lawsuit. Oh, that's on the ACT. Oh my goodness! Yeah. 
this this ACF lawsuit is just CTA as the named main named oh, litigant. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you know, but you know, we have there's money that's been put towards it. You know, even from HTA, from other trucking companies. So, but they're the named litigant. They're the lead dog on this one, and cool. <clears throat> we'll see what happens. But again, the state of California, the fifth largest economy in the world, they have bottomless legal resources. They will take it all the way to the Supreme Court if they feel like they're justified in it. So if it's enjoined, doesn't mean that it's going away. And that's where we might get some potential to sit down with ARB and say, okay, here's some things that we could live with. We know it's not going to go away. The rules, gonna, it is what it is. We're eventually going to be zero emissions. But how do we get there? Is there a more palatable way to apply the rule because especially for people who have hustled and made the investments to get trucks in before the end of this year, then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, nope, you don't have to worry about that. Now it's like, well, you know, state of California, I planned for this. You've been telling me I have to do this for over a year. Now I did it frustrating and you pulled the rug out from under me. Right. So perhaps we'll see an opportunity to do some negotiation. And now the ones that were proactive are at a disadvantage right. because everyone else didn't it's make that big of an investment. Damned and if you risk. do, damned if you yeah. don't, unfortunately. So we'll see. All right. Well, as always, thank you so much yeah, for your time. You, and I appreciate it, man. Wh- where can they reach you guys? Do they have any more questions? Yeah, check uh, out. Sign check up out. for that yeah, December 7th. Sign up for the December 7th meeting. You know, we have our Trucker Advantage program. It's free for fleets of one to three. You just sign up, you get the emails, you get information. That it's information is key. You know, we share stuff with you guys, obviously, and push it out as as you see fit. Um, there's some other webinars coming up on the clean truck check that ARB is holding. We got another webinar on November twenty eighth with the ARB on the clean truck check. There's a Spanish one, I saw see, that. See, see, see. See. So there's the information's out there. And like I said, the the tap thing is it's free. It's information, man. Like we're just because you can see social media. Yeah, there's some stuff out there. You guys do a great job of sharing, you know, some funny memes, which I get a kick out of. But also, there's good information, mm-hmm. and yeah, maybe people just gloss over the information because it's not some dude walking down the 710 with a ponytail, right? That's probably not a carb compliant ponytail. Yeah, right? definitely um, not. So that's more entertaining, <laughs> right? That stuff is funny. This stuff not funny, and that's yeah. why people maybe are like. It's cognitive dissonance. They're like, oh, well, it'll never happen. Or mm-hmm. that's not going to happen to me. Mm-hmm. And the fact of the matter is it is. So information is critical. So it's like I hope all your listeners are following. Obviously, you're following you guys and uh, follow HTA on Instagram or Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, I try to be pretty active on LinkedIn. Um, and then our website, man, you sign up for TAP. You get all the information. Uh, you can log in. You can look at the behind the members wall. And of course, there's an opportunity to join HTA as a fleet carrier member. Uh, we have a thousand bucks for a fleet that's one to ten, and then you're kind of a full fledged member. Otherwise, you know, it's good to sign up, man. Just get the just get in there. There's get the no, numbers up. There's nothing that's required of anybody. You know, you just gotta show we up. Try to keep it one to three. You know, because we really want to get it for just just for small fleets. So, information's out there. Look it up. Track us down. And I'm always happy to answer questions anytime for anybody. Yeah, we should come up with something to collab on. Yeah, you know, man. Like let's get, do it. Get the people together. But oh, I, all right, let's do it. You know, December seventh, we'll be over at the Harbor Facility Maintenance Facility in Port of Long Beach. Uh, it's up on our website and socials. Sign up for it. it's an in person web in person meeting mm-hmm. about all this stuff in person. So there'll be a chance to ask pers- in person questions directly. And you know, sometimes misery loves company, right? So you just come out and kind of commiserate with everyone else. Take your notebook. Stuff. Yeah, phone. Take your notebook. And yeah. So, Absolutely. But we'll do it. Well, I appreciate it, Lisa. I always appreciate hey, the opportunity. And it's always good to talk to you guys, too. Yeah. So um, come find us out there, man. Yeah. And, Thanks for your time absolutely. and all the Thank knowledge. You. I hope you guys learned something today. And uh, see you guys on the next one. Peace.